Good evening. Namaste. Very common answer overlapping where what coaching should be or what we think as coaching. I also see very often that my clients, I'm sure for many of you, regardless of which, which side of the table that you actually sit on, coaching actually ends up being an important and a vital tool at different points of time, ends up lending that very special hand to make you grow, to make your business grow. But as we know, as we have read in so many of these coaching books, sample books, all books like, if you have some of you remember, uh, Eli Goldratt's Google, it's something which lends that edge, but the recipient also needs to be able to receive that, receive the encouragement, receive the slight maturing, receive the slight consulting, receive the load of the knowledge which is coming their way as well. So that's today's conversation. I would love for you to make use of the opportunity, make use of our speakers today, who I'll introduce. I'm Desai. He used to be the CEO of Bombay Store. Many of you might have been his customers in one way, retail customers. I ended up meeting him long time back in one of his uh, retail conferences in Mumbai by number nine. And we sort of been acquainted after that. I'm a after his regular corporate type of CEO type of street, he runs his own outfit. He's an executive professional business coach. And that's his take to our conversation today. Sangeeta Sumesh is a TEDx speaker. She's a uh, fairly known coach, and I knew her before I actually started getting acquainted with, with her. So, welcome, Sangeeta, as well. This is a very good one. I call it money for short. I've known him for a while, while as well. This is his 17th year after founding and been running conventional learning. His work revolves around learning, learning philosophy, and also coaching. And finally, our host for the day, Shankar. Shankar and I go back a long way. We used to be colleagues in Accenture um, for, for quite a while. Many cups of coffee, many late nights, etc., et and all, all that, that type of work. And I invite Shankar to host today's session. And I'll, I'll just leave you with that. Thank you very much, and over to you, Thank you, Suhas. Good evening, everybody, and it's wonderful to have you all here. Uh, we're really looking forward to having you here and having a very interesting and engaging and a robust discussion today on business mentoring. And uh, you know, as, as we begin talking about you know making business mentoring effective, let me just thirty seconds on where I'm coming from as I approach this topic. Uh, I spent a large portion of my career as a consultant, spent a large portion of my time providing solutions to people as a consultant. After having spent a long time in corporate, I, I did my coaching certification through one of the internationally recognized coaching associations and I got myself certified as a professional coach. So I spent a lot of time talking to people because that's one area where I'm really, really interested in it. It's, it excites me talking to people and uh, generally getting to know them better, their dreams, their aspirations, and if I can contribute in some way towards helping them achieve what they want to do, uh, I, I think that's a very satisfying outcome uh, from that. And as I progressed in my coaching career, I also had people who were coming up to me and saying, you know, share your experience, tell us how we can, you know, whether if I'm a startup, how I can scale, if I'm a technology company, how do I adapt? You know, what business models do I need to adapt based on having done so many things, similar uh, kind of, you know, business transformations and uh, organization strategies. So I, I found myself playing multiple roles throughout this period of time of a consultant, a coach, a mentor. So I think it's important for us to level set on what we mean by business mentoring, because there's a lot of terms that, you know, one can use this counseling, coaching, therapy. Uh, consulting. So let's you know begin by getting everybody onto the same page in, in terms of what do we mean as a panel uh, is, is business mentoring. So I'd invite uh, uh, our panel members to share their perspective and their thoughts. Mani, do you want to, you had a great story, so maybe you can share that with the <laughs> team. I know, I know. Homer's ODC. Mentor is actually, you know, Odysseus's friend to whom, you know, Odysseus entrusted his son's well-being or guidance. And interestingly, in, in Greek mythology, Athena, the goddess of uh, valor and wisdom, 
uh, Saraswati Durga combo, if I must say. So she actually took the guise of mentor to uh, influence. Okay, so there are two things you know that come out very powerfully in terms of uh, symbolism here. So Homer, uh, number one, make sure that a mentor does not directly intervene and help, does not really uh, prescribe. Uh, a mentor influences, okay, and makes you think and deal with you on your own, okay, deal with your problems on your own. That, uh, to me, was a powerful symbolism. And eventually, you see what you see. We use mentor as if it's an English verb or an English, uh, you know, a word or a noun. That was very enamoring to me, okay, when I first read. And I named my company Mentor after being very inspired by it. And, and the last part that Homer stresses quite a bit in that symbolism is that if you really want to nurture someone, there is both the male and the female aspects to it. So he actually calls out saying, you know, guidance, rigor and virility, the uh, masculine uh, traits, care, sensitivity, nurturing, okay, and uh, intuition being the uh, feminine uh, traits, okay, so uh, that's beautiful. Anyone who can kind of go and uh, do a little Googling and read, uh, maybe an abridged version of Odyssey can take a look at what Mentor does there. Yeah, so, yeah great. Uh, Mani, I would also probably like to add on and uh, share my experience, personal experience. Is that okay, Shankar? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Please go ahead. So, I have been both on the, on the other side. I mean, although I'm a business coach, I have I believe everybody needs a coach. We'll come to that later on. Uh, but I have been both a mentee as well as a coachee. And I want to share my little real life experience here. So I have a mentor and uh, he is my mentor who has been my mentor to, you know, I've, I went through this program for women on corporate boards. We were a group of handpicked women and um, we were being mentored to get and be ready to be our independent directors on the board. So my mentor, very senior, very accomplished person, and he had large number of years of experience. So obviously he's been a domain expert, right? And he was the one who mentored me and, you know, I've been an independent director. Now, this happened a few years ago and thereafter, another uh, exciting company approached me and they wanted me to be on their board as an independent director. So I was quite excited because it's an emerging industry and it sounded really good. So I was kind of contemplating and actually in my mind, I thought, you know, I will take up the road. So I went to meet my mentor and then I was pretty excited about it. And, you know, I said I have been offered a role of an independent director and that's all. I didn't even complete the sentence. He didn't even hear me. He didn't ask me which company or which industry. So all that he said was unless it's a company of very good repute, very well known, you know, in all ways, I wouldn't even advise you to take it up. Now, I was very disappointed when I heard that because like I said, you know, I had mentally thought I would take up the offer. So his point of view was, he said, no, I wouldn't advise you to take up this role right now because the laws are very stringent. You know, the liabilities for independent directors is really high and therefore I wouldn't recommend you to take up this role. So then I went back to the company and I kind of refused. I didn't tell them any reason but uh, they were very keen on having me on board so they kept coming back to me and then saying you know no it would be great to have you on board and everything and in my heart i really wanted to join so i was in a dilemma i didn't know whether to take it up or not i mean i didn't want to go against my mentor but then it did sound pretty interesting so when i was in this dilemma i thought i will have a coaching conversation with my peer coach so during the coaching conversation the coach, like Mani exactly said, coach uh, doesn't tell you what to do. You know, the coach just allows you to reflect and makes you think. So during the conversation, what emerged for me was, you know, what action I need to take in for me to evaluate this particular proposition that had come my way. So the action I decided to take was to reach out to few people who have, you know, were past uh, board members of the particular company and you know check out for me what was important was the corporate governance so i said okay let me reach out to the concerned people and then i got to know that they were within my network so when i spoke to this person what i got to know was 
the corporate governance was not very strong in this particular company and that to me was a very big weakness because you know then their liabilities are high and you know it exposes you to unwanted stuff so therefore i was able to make up my mind that this is not the right opening for me so you see the difference is the mentor actually tells you mentor says it out of their experience whereas a coach doesn't tell you the coach allows you to think and reflect to see what is best for you because if you have a challenge you have the solution to it as well so the coach just provides that space and you know lets you think and empowers you to take your own decisions so uh, that has been my experience and i thought this was a very good real life mm. example for people to differentiate because what i've noticed is you know the terms mentor and coach have always been very loosely and you know interchangeably used the fact is because many people don't know the difference i was like that too before i became a coach so i thought this would be a good way to highlight the difference so oh, uh, beautiful i just wanted to add one uh, little dimension to it the coach takes a lot of ownership to outcomes okay and therefore tries to work it through you because sustainability comes you know from there the mentor apparently owns your transformation and has a little bit of paternal maternal instincts okay about your transformation so therefore a little bit of prescription you know comes in there yes uh, yeah that's why <laughs> the mentor is a domain expert whereas a coach need not be a domain expert that is the okay. yes. and, and that's yeah. what brings us uh, anak from your perspective you know as we look at these different aspects of coaching mentoring etc so let's focus on business mentoring right so in your you know how how do you see a business mentor so uh, i will be a consultant then a coach and then a mentor and uh, currently uh, it's an overlap at some places and some effectively what i look as a consultant is most uh, indian companies hire a consultant to do the bad work which they cannot get their own people to do so it is typically uh, no no we, we should not be taking bad decisions let's get somebody else to take a bad decision and write it off and it is just recently uh, i would say over the last 15 years 18 years where you see uh, you know uh, marico mariwala and all of them talk about an executive coach and a business coach on a one to one where people have started understanding what a coach actually helps them to achieve and it's very very different then a consultant a consultant can come to your office and in your absence talk to 20 people and try to put something right a coach necessarily does not talk to 20 people and a mentor may not even be visible in your office or to uh, people within your office a mentor may know the entire business but he would still be guiding you his uh, hindsight is your oversight kind of a thing so primarily i say while uh, some component of it overlaps even today uh, one of the crucial areas which uh, probably currently the need of the r in india is on a from a business perspective is uh, most of, uh, most people in the last one year one and a half year or maybe even 10 years have suddenly started getting the entrepreneurial bug and most of the startups are 23 25 year old you know who have understood they don't come from a business background but they have managed it acha somebody else is making a million dollars i will also make a million dollars but it is not true always and it is this at some point of time when you know from a vc perspective we used to uh, get in one was what was known as a holding officer who would uh, negotiate and help you guide and uh, help the entrepreneurs the other would be a kind of a mentor who would tell that person Well, this is not how it is done. This is how you do it. So, typically, that today is gaining traction. What I see is anybody, any an employer gives a gig to an employee, and to save taxes on both sides becomes a consultant. So, consultant is now completely out of the loop as far mm-hmm. as I am concerned. So, sure. there. But business today is looking at coach and Roxes and X and a Y and a Airtel and all of that, and he comes very focused of leading this team. from a seventh position to a second position kind of a thing and his focus is just that and then you have uh, in the retail segment what we term as a merchandising coach that coach evolves saying that what is kept where and how it is kept for you to become an expert and learn and give you numbers back and the mentor 
currently today is i have seen larger companies definitely yes uh, smaller they are on a one on one with an entrepreneur or the co-founders trying to do three things majorly one is uh, get everybody on a level playing field because if you have co- mm-hmm. two or three co-founders eventually 18 months to uh, two years two and a half years later there is always a kind of a friction whether should i be doing this should i not be doing this evaluating that today and bringing kind of anecdotal series a story of what went wrong a story of what is outside not visible is what a mentor today does for business because everybody does not believe in analytics and facts and figures people you know love to read stories about are ha magar wo fab ball to nahi chala tha hum kyun nahi chalenge that kind of a thing and that is where these kind of things you know make a larger impact rather than just saying that no oh, you do it this way true very That's true the business part of it this kind of urges me to look at it in a slightly more fundamental way you know uh, over the last 25 years through my company i worked with about 150000 people okay and we when we look at data one interesting thing emerges beautifully adults you know like to learn in private yes <laughs> they don't like one to many settings i have found that critical employees leaders people who make a big difference to a business i think it it is beginning to make tremendous sense to make them learn in private okay help yes. them reflect on all that so that brings the relevance of mentoring and how it can add you know significantly to uh, uh, people and i was looking at the kind of people so predominantly people who work with me and have benefited the most are either entrepreneurs small medium uh, leaders in large corporations okay who the corporation wants uh, some support or sometimes you know senior sales guys who are struggling so people who are dealing with a lot of ambiguity okay and they are struggling with ambiguity seem to be benefiting the most you know from this private learning experience and the way it makes the biggest impact is sometimes a small shift in paradigm in a few conversations i remember i was able to shift the paradigm of an entrepreneur from focusing on the supply side of his business and over investing on the supply side of his business to beginning to optimally invest on the demand side of his business and that paradigm shift took them to a 3x change in top line nearly over a 18 month period okay and all uh, all i ended up doing as a coach was to shift the thinking from focusing too much on the supply side to focusing optimally on the demand side that's just an example so the key points are private learning is making a big difference to critical employees in organizations and the idea of coaching is to create those little paradigm mm-hmm. shifts those little shifts in mindset that cause you know breakthrough outcomes okay that happens. yeah so i like you said something that really struck me as you know very pointedly which said you know your hindsight is their oversight so which is yeah. you know that's where the business mentors expertise come in and i just want to share an example of you know, work with a technology company a team of founders and uh, each one you know had very strong skill sets in 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 diff- diverse areas so it was a very good team dynamic but as a result of the diversity of thinking there was also a sort of pull in different directions when it came to strategy for the organization you know as i'm defining a 3 to 5 year strategy there were different viewpoints because people were coming at it from their own you know cognitive biases or focus uh, which they thought the company should have and my role as a business mentor now here's one thing which is sort of where i'm going with this example is in this case my accountability as a business mentor was to the organization right to make sure that the organization was able to use my experience and says okay i know where you know this team wants to do this but as an organization here's where you could be you know headed and then get their viewpoints get them to either accept or reject or you know dissect and customize that opinion 
mean, I wasn't running the company. Like they were running the company operationally. They were responsible for the direction, but in helping shaping their thinking towards a convergent outcome, which they would all look at and say, you know what, that makes sense for us as an organization. That was my responsibility. So it wasn't to an individual within that team, but it was really to make sure that the organization as a whole you know, gets that strategy. So I want to come to this point about you know effectiveness of a business mentor and a business mentor. Let me take a quick second here. Uh, when we spoke about business mentor, there is this uh, large uh, organization here, uh, uh, close to you know thirty thousand employees all across the world, and uh, you know whatever sixty CEOs, etc., 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 and. Uh, they had invited a lunch presentation of half an hour saying, how do I navigate the digital minefield? Because all their CEOs are 50 and above. And we had, and a lot of CEOs asking questions, like the CEO said, you know, we, we are the only plant in Gujarat which has achieved this. And there was pin drop silence in the room because neither the group CEO, the owners, none of them had any clue of this happening. So when it found out, how did you tell people he said, I had asked my secretary to send an email, but I believe she went on maternity leave. So it got stuck somewhere and that could have been Tom Tom all across. So then finally, when I started doing the digital uh, one on ones with them, they suddenly realized that how positive it became for them to be able to understand their employees and talk to them one on one. Instead of you know treating them as okay, you are poor in Facebook, pe hai, Twitter, pe hai kind of a story. So I, I think what you are saying is right. It, it it is one in private, two is never run it down. Absolutely. Yeah. Two uh, the experiences that I've had as a coach. One is for a, a startup bootstrapped entrepreneur. Uh, you know he was being so cost conscious on every little thing. So in one of the coaching conversations, he said like you know I'm being so uh, you know tight-fisted with my cost that, you know, I actually uh, did the website of my startup by myself. I, I'm not a uh, techie, but I learned how to do it. And then, you know, it took me X number of hours to come up with a good website. And he was trying to say that, you know, I, because I didn't want to spend an outsourcing to somebody to develop the website. Now, the question I asked him was, I said, great, you, you managed to save this cost, but you know, the amount of the X hours that you spent doing it, if you were to have invested in the business, how would that look? And he, you know, that opened up a world to him because with the limited time that he had, you know, he was focusing on saving the cost, but this way it totally opened up his uh, inflow. You know, he said, you know, my revenue was able to grow now because I was being penny wise and found foolish. So, you know, that is a paradigm shift. Similarly, I've been a coach to um, a listed company, a very large group. And uh, the CEO has been struggling, especially with, uh, you know, all the lockdown and the pandemic. The business obviously got hit and they were trying to see how best they can recover and recoup. So during the conversation again, you know, uh, I said, you know, what is it that all of you together, you know, you have a large workforce. So which direction are you headed? What is the purpose? What is the mission? And, you know, what is the value that you have? And it was amazing. You know, I was also surprised that even though the group is like about 40 year old, they still do not have a clear vision and a mission and, you know, the values, the purpose is not being defined. So that was like an eye opener and then they said no i think the, as a first step we need to define the purpose statement and see where the business is headed and you know all whether our actions are in line with the purpose and the overall objective so i think no. that way a coach can really uh, open up different perspectives and different thought process because they kindle the thoughts they challenge you allow you to reflect and see what action needs to be taken to achieve what you want oh, so sangeeta <laughs> funnily in mm. organizations, mm. people are so conditioned to ask answering all the questions, there are very few left to ask all the right questions. Okay, so the, the, <laughs> the issue uh, organizations face at times is challenge their critical people to ask all the right questions. Okay, and uh, yes, that's yes. what the coach does. I, and, and, and by right. the way, just one just one additional line and i want to let 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 some thinking happen here i'm a trained metallurgist i have watched you know materials 
change their properties when environments have changed. And uh, that's what actually brought me into working with people. I found that men and material are very similar, okay? So by changing the environment, you can change properties of materials, made me feel you do the same thing with people. Now, uh, one of the things that I find very uh, dichotomous and very concerning in coaching or business mentoring is that, look, it's not just appreciative inquiry that adds value as a coach or as a mentor. Okay, appreciative inquiry is the fundamental value that we bring in as a coach and uh, mentor. But the absence of scientific models, the absence of good measurements, okay, and bringing some science to coaching is something that I believe can make a big impact in making coaching or mentoring a lot more effective. So I think before we go, we go, let me leave you with a tag. You should uh, put in the, uh, below your mentor, you should mm. put in, I used to... Um, uh, you know, mentor metal, <laughs> mix metal. Now I mix yeah, people. Yeah, <laughs> I, absolutely. I, mean, I think <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's a, that may be a separate session on chatting. I'm just going to move to your questions because yeah. we are sort of half. You know, it's half time. I want to yeah. make sure we get questions from people. There's yeah, a question yeah, that's come up. It says, you know, these days people with little experience are starting to become coaches with one certification from somewhere. Is that appropriate? So let me flip that question into a little more positive and on money, you started talking about this. What makes a good business mentor? What are the attributes that one should possess? You know, and I'll leave it open to the panel to take this to become a good business mentor. Certification in coaching is one thing, right? But I think there are some skills and attributes one must possess. Domain we have talked about, domain to help you, you know, you're a retail expert, right? So obviously if someone is looking at the retail industry, they have a lot to learn and you have a lot to share from them. Money talked about metallurgy, Sangeet, they talked about coaching. So, in fact, I, I was raking my brains on uh, which are the attributes, you know, uh, which are the properties that make a good coach. Okay, so to, to use my engineering language, which are the properties that make uh, someone a good coach? You know, I, I realized that um, without a certain business acumen, you need not be a domain expert. But I think you need to have some business acumen. You must understand, you know, how to kind of make connections uh, in business. You should uh, be quick to pick jargon and things like that. I find that as a very important attribute. Second, I think, you know, successful uh, coaches, executive coaches or mentors that I have seen, uh, seem to show some orientation to rigor and orientation to making trials happen. That makes a big difference, okay? It's not just about, you know, doing appreciative inquiry, but taking it a step forward and making some trial happen, making that nudge, okay, uh, which makes the guy try. So that is another important thing. So it's about giving tangible ideas for trial, but not prescribing, okay? So that is a very important aspect. I mean, there are multiple other things I'm sure you can, you guys can kind of. I think that the, the tag for that is I will show you where to look, but not what to see. Yeah. Right. Sure. That. Perfect. Perfect. Now, like you definitely said, you know, the credentialing, the experience, all that matters. But I think also what is important is, you know, what sort of chemistry do you have? Like, you know, are you at ease? with, you know, uh, talking to the coach, you know, are you, a, do you share the same sort of wavelength and uh, what does your gut feel tell you, you know, because uh, this is like a long-term relationship. It's not like it's, uh, you know, one stand. So what sort of uh, rapport do you share with the coach? Because I think a lot of the success of the coaching also depends on so the kind of relationship is there with the coach, right? So you should know how to rely on your intuition and, uh, see whether you know you're comfortable sharing because a lot of it has to do with uh, you know your internal feelings you know the coach displays empathy to you so you know you must feel the comfort level in sharing whatever you want to and then it's not like you know i can share only a part of it be able to have that open and free relationship so i think that also plays a very important role in the success and of course apart from that the experience of the coach and then the kind of yeah. testimonials they have all that is secondary but i think primarily the the so relation I, I i call that as you know ability to communicate listening 
Whether you actually listen or not doesn't matter, but yes, you should yes, be able yes. to make the other guy feel you are listening. Yes, I think you are listening to the key skills uh, that a coach possesses. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. Anand, uh, different question for you. I think there's yeah. another one that's come up is how does the business mentor get skin in the game? Right now we talked about outcomes and you know what makes a good mentor, but how do we get the business mentor committed to the outcome? Okay, so uh, let me put it uh, uh, two ways. The first answer is when uh, people ask me, there are two things which I uh, one was I realized uh, uh, early in my career that uh, I am an introvert. So I needed a policy that I would meet one new person every working day throughout my career. And I kept it to that. It, it can be anybody. I mean, it can be a person to whom I go and sell. Just refining how the relationship works. And that translates into I was successful in keeping the customer the same. But every product I moved from a courier to logistics to travel to in, uh, e-commerce to retail all of that, I managed the customer remained the same for me. And when I would call them up and say, this is Anak Desai, they say, hi, what are you doing now? I'm doing, oh yeah, yeah we would like to buy something. From you. Okay. So I did not need to search for customers. The relationship was very strong and the relationship always lasts longer than what you. Second was experiment and failures. The more you fail, the better your empathy is. Because it's like, you know, every day morning when you are working and you are an employee, you need to go out from your house, reminding yourself that you should not have an ego, but don't let anybody trample on your self-respect, right? So you keep on experimenting. And there have been various ways I have written this, but one thing which is there is I operated on a build, own and transfer basis. So wherever, whichever companies I have worked for more than five years, after the second year, I have moved into the company on a higher level or a different project altogether or something. Because I personally believe more than 18 months doing the same work and you know, not experimenting enough, not failing enough, not learning enough is what kills. Those are some of the points which make you easily accessible to people and understand people's point of view. Now comes skin in the game and which is very uh, useful because the last uh, 10 uh, years or the decade when I have been very actively um, as a, uh, we have uh, you know undertaken outsourced CXO projects where the outcome decided close to 30-35% of our fees so if it was a retail outfit and they had a problem in merchandising we would guarantee that the merchandising would get you know, whatever, instead of a three time turn, uh, roll around to a four time roll around in a year's time. And the money would be based, based on that. So a lot of people do not agree to that. But, um, uh, you know, if uh, there is exciting, uh, if it is exciting enough, I see no reason why you should not put your skin in the game. Yeah, so it also, it also story happens. Story. What is the end, end figure? See, you, you will find uh, somebody who is coming to you and saying, first, the negotiation will be on your fees. After the fees are negotiated, one month later, they'll come and say, Iska bhi aadha karke aadha baad mein lena. <laughs> that is not the kind of, I mean, it has to be, you know, attractive enough for you to really have your skin in the game. Otherwise, no. might as well be, uh, be an employee and work that way or you open your own business. Yeah. True. Shankar, I wanted to go back to the previous question you uh, raised, which is a lot of people uh, with very limited kind of probably exposure to coaching or wanting to be coaches, they get certifications, etc., etc. Right? I think that was a question. Yeah, I think the question was really to do with the experience of the coaches. You know, yeah. as to how many you know to be effective, right? Now, yeah. just as, uh, to, before you expand, I'll just give an example. When I did my coaching certification, uh, there was you know a girl with us who was doing a certification she was in early 20s and she was doing a coaching to become a career coach for millennials mm -hmm. so i think coaching is a broad topic and you know mm -hmm. where we are focusing on specifically is you know the business coaching and business mentoring now we've been using these term coaching and mentoring interchangeably yeah, right, right, yeah. yeah. so yeah. maybe there is this somewhere in our mind coaching and mentoring are in at the business in you know, the outcome is the business Correct, you know, correct. Metrics, whether yeah. it's top line, bottom line, but the process 
is probably following something correct, similar. Correct. So that's where that question was coming yeah. from. Anyway. No, I wanted to make a very important point. Okay, so in the in the last fifteen years, I have been meeting a steady stream of people who come to me because I've been there around, you know, for a long enough time. They ask this question: Look, I want to become a trainer or I want to become a coach. Okay, so this is a very large number of people I have spoken to. and when i asked them this question so what's your motivation why do you want to do this the biggest insight i've got is that a lot of people look at coaching or training from their perspective they look at it as you know they being on a pedestal and be able to offer their knowledge okay and there is a little bit of a need for adulation and they think you know it is easy to belt out advice okay and i have found practically 8 to 9 out of 10 people coming with this motivation into this game only one or two out of 10 i see coming with a motivation of enjoying transformation and being committed to transformation okay so that's the tough part of coaching for coaching or mentoring to become effective uh again uh, going back to coaching or mentoring like i said coaching is providing practical ideas for skill building and you know getting outcomes up uh mentoring is throwing practical ideas you know for coming out of personal dilemmas shifting of perspectives and so on and so forth whichever is something that you are attempting i have noticed all, all, all of that is fine but i draw the line at this life coach 21 year old life coach okay. <laughs> no, i was just coming to that no, so like career career and no, i was just they picked me up from linkedin and offered me a 30% discount on their fees saying that we will teach you how to live your life yeah. no i'm not hitting the nail on the head and that's what i'm trying to say i have not seen any coach adding value if the coach's motivation is not transformation Exactly. Okay. If the coach's motivation is parting with knowledge and you know asking a bunch of appreciative inquiry questions, then I think you know it doesn't work. Sorry, I have a slightly different uh, viewpoint here. So the coach doesn't provide solutions. The coach doesn't tell you what to do. Coach doesn't <laughs> instruct you. Coach just gives you the space to reflect because, like I said, if you have a challenge, you have the solution to it as well. So in a business setup, like. nobody else would know the business as good as the entrepreneur or you know the corporate leader running it including the intricacies and stuff so the coach doesn't tell you the coach doesn't instruct you a coach is not a counselor or a mentor and like i said coach need not be a the domain expert now if i let's say need some inputs from you on metallurgy i would come to you and you know because you are you know everything about metallurgy i may or may not know i may still be a starter so i would come to a mentor and get your guidance because you would talk based on your experience and the knowledge that you gained over the period of time but with a coach that's not how it works and to answer the question of the skin in the game yes this uh, there is a lot of uh, you know debate that goes around this so as a coach as a business coach now i have changed a bit of my revenue model so what i do is i take a very minimal uh, amount as a retainership depending on you know what the engagement is but thereafter i go on a success fee so that you know the the client understands that i do have a skin in the game as well because i'm interested in his welfare in the transformation and i want him to be successful so that creates a, a win win for everybody around so these uh, were my yeah. perspectives yeah uh, so we thought uh, just to follow up to that yeah as it's sort of it's shifting gears slightly you know i realize we have a limited time left so i want to yes. cover two two areas that uh, sure. they have questions from the audience on typically in your experience what sort of is the duration that you see this transformation in what, you know how long does transformation take i know it's see, a very there difficult is, thing yeah, there, there is no one size that fits all so the basic thing for you know coaching or probably even mentoring to work is the intent now unless you have the intent to transform i don't think anybody in the world can help you so intention is the first thing and thereafter it depends on the kind of challenges you you have and you know your uh, thirst to achieve your set targets and goals so it varies it's not like it will happen overnight and it's not like you know it's going to take forever so it all depends on the person who is uh, getting coached or being yeah. mentored 
So I'll give you a perspective on that. Okay. So learning engineering is my specialty. So I work on numbers and times and methods and periods and all that. Let's take a small uh, example. Okay. Here is a leader who is constantly getting into difficulty or is getting into problems with his performance because of his inability to say no. And I've seen, you know, uh, problems like this become big bottlenecks. Okay. Or someone who in a conversation gives information four to eight times more than seeks information. Okay. So these are interesting metrics for you. A G by S ratio or the uh, average number of times, you know, you refuse to say no. Uh, what I do is I use these metrics. Okay. As icons of change. So if I can get someone to progressively say no when they want to say no instead of say yes when they want to say no. And I use methods like defect marking. So you mark the number of times you notice that behavior or other people notice that behavior. To get a change, Shankar, I, I'm trying to answer the question in a, in a pointed way. To get one such behavior change, okay, the minimum time it takes, okay, is between 12 and 16 weeks. And I find a 20 week sustenance. For example, if you find that you are doing zero defect weeks, you know, consistently for a few weeks, then you could say that the habit is stuck in you. So Shankar, such a, a complete, a complete, uh, uh, you know, 360 degree answer to this. Yeah. is coming from uh, nowhere close to analytics or his excel sheets or uh, marking or something uh, working with kv kamath and his team we used to have something which was known as the 90 day project cycle okay, okay. it's a harvard study and if you cannot complete a project in 90 days you throw the project aside and move on to the next project right. and i today deploy that which is why this one hour mentor which i use that in that one hour, I will tell you, will I be able to help and work with you or no? Because it doesn't make sense for me to keep trying to sell myself to that person for one month. Correct. And then come to a conclusion that hoga, nahi hoga, ye hoga, kind of a thing. And in 90 days, done right, there is an end to one, a project. Yeah. So, so uh, in this 90 in, days, in, how do they uh, maximize what they get out of you? What can the Mentee do to maximize their time with you. The expectations are laid out. No, they, they also have to follow up on the expectations that when they come to you and they are so, a set of expectations. No, so uh, coming to expectations, you know, in two sessions, I try and reach a performance contract. Sure. And a performance contract typically consists of outcomes they want to achieve as well as behaviors that will cause those outcomes. If I can't reach that in two sessions, then I am heading right. nowhere. Agreed. And uh, each behavior takes between 12 weeks to 16 weeks to get, get, make progress. And you're absolutely right. If there are no trials, so between two coaching sessions, I make sure trials happen and I make the coachee complete a tracker. It's not, I mean, he writes, he writes down what he did. Okay. Kind of a thing. Unless there are trials, behavior change is not possible. So, and uh, that's the important thing. Yeah. So money in this, these performance contract, are these business metrics or behavioral KPIs? What is? No. So I differentiate the two, whether it's an individual or an organization. Okay. The individual is my consumer. Okay. He is the client. The sponsor can be the organization. So I agree with my client on two things. One, what are the outcomes you want? For example, do you want to make a partner in 18 months? Do you want to become 20% more productive in some time? Those are outcomes that you want. I don't guarantee outcomes. Okay. But I know that if those are the outcomes that you want, then we try and work hard enough to find out what are the behaviors that you must change. Okay. And I'll give you a very quick example and for someone to, to achieve, you know, a much higher sales productivity. I worked on a simple metric. I said in any conversation, you are giving information to seeking information ratio has to be one to one. And when we started, it was around five to one. When I got him to change from five to one to one to one, 
automatically his sales productivity increased by almost about 30 35%. So making these connections is important. Okay, I have found performance contracting on both ends. The outcomes you want to change and therefore what behaviors you should change to get those outcomes as a very crucial element of becoming successful or making your coaching effect. So there's a follow up question from one of the audience. Uh, shouldn't the mentor be just looking at the mentee and the role he or she's playing and work to make him build the right skills without looking at the outcome? Yeah, great question. So let me share my experiences. So I'm I am a chartered accountant basically by background, a CFO who's turned a business coach. So you know, in one client, they wanted me to conduct a group session for the general managers and above, and they want they wanted me. The objective of the group coaching session was for them to understand finance. So what I did was to blend the two, right? So because finance is my domain, and how can I add value there, right? So what I did was I blended the two. Now it's not like these guys don't know finance and you know don't know how it operates. So all the shift that I had to I created was for them to think from the finance angle because they are domain experts. They are into manufacturing and uh, uh, you know they have a large number of years of experience. So they are so focused in the domain that they don't think of the financial outcomes for the organization. And like you know, for any organization, you know, end of the day, it all translates to financial metrics. All I had to do was you know create the transformation in them to get them thinking on the financial terms and understand what the financial repercussions are they needed to bring. So I'm into high performance and you know with the finance. I think that makes a great combination for them to start thinking on the transformation that they can bring about and contribute to the success of the organization. Got so it. I think creating so that. So there are uh, there are no yeah. there are no generic right skills or generic Absolutely. right behaviors you can work on. Yeah. Correct. Uh, there are only appropriate behaviors that you get people to work on, which are in line with what they want as organization values. Yeah. yeah. So there's one question I'll take before we move to summation. Uh, it says, is it better to have clear demarcation of roles between partners, or should there be an overlap? This is for an organization with less than five employees. I'll take that one. Uh, I, I think you know. In an organization with less than five employees, there is no, everything goes. I've been part of a technology startup many years ago. This is during the first bubble. Clearly, we didn't make money. Others that have been on my yacht in my private island somewhere. But I'm here on <laughs> this call. But I, I think when you're that small, I think everybody has strengths and you play to those strengths rather than uh, have clear demarcation of roles. I think as the organization grows, I think it's important to have accountability clarified as to who's primary and who's secondary. But when you're less than five people, I think it's uh, it's a little too early to have very clear okay. demarcation as long as you know each other's strengths. Shankar, uh, uh, let me, um, um, uh, without fees, uh, putting skin in the game, let me answer this gentleman. Uh, whoever has asked this question needs to take his partner, go out and over a couple of beers, sort out the you know inherent problem you have which is not related to business and come back and start business, you will be more successful. <laughs> this, there's more. Than, and, there's a question and several questions behind that question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, no, I, I think, I think, you know, if you go back and look at all research towards, you know, productivity and effectiveness in anything that you do, I think the, the basic cornerstone is role clarity. Okay, I think being clear about who does what obviously leads, you know, that's the money, cornerstone to money, money, money. We are talking five people that is you, your wife and children. So when children were growing and you're newly married, you ruled. Today, children rule. It's simple. <laughs> yeah. It's it's all, uh, you know, a metaphorosis of a butterfly and all that. <laughs> yeah. Just grab a couple of beers, sort it out and get ready to do business and make money. Yeah. It's I think entry. grabbing a couple of beers and a cup of coffee and toss, toss, sorting it out is like the world's answer to most world's problem. You can solve most things with that approach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kya, yaar, do din mat bolo. But why get into you got so, together for a good business? Do so, that business, no? Yeah. So I think it's been a fascinating conversation. All we have, you know, from what just to sort of you know maybe take thirty seconds yeah. to sum up. But we have a finance person, a metallurgist. A luxury goods entrepreneur, a technologist with a finance fintech background, and all of us are business coaches and mentors. So clearly, we've had our journeys, you know, as we have reached this stage. 
and i think there was a question you know how does one move from corporate life to becoming a business coach i think a lot of what we talked about which is really having that right mindset having the right intent as you want to become a coach building those skills along the way and i think that's where it you know it, it comes to making business mentoring effective so i, I think we've touched on a lot of areas in this uh, conversation uh, we may not have addressed everything i'm sure there's a lot more conversations but we can have but if i could each ask you to sort of give your closing 30 second closing before we hand over to suhas i'll i'll go first if you want to become a business executive coach or a business mentor do it for the right motivation if you really enjoy transforming people get into it don't get into it as a vocation you won't find clients okay so that's the point yeah so absolutely i would second that with money so unless you have the heart there and you really want to have the people benefit and make them feel better in whatever they do you know because a lot like i said has to do with our feelings more than doing so if you are happy with what you do great or you know you must be able to contribute to them to their success that's when you need to take it up i would go against them uh, these days you know can i you know pick your brains over coffee seems the cheapest thing to do and unfortunately all of us have houses also to run So why are we a coffee guy, man? <laughs> we, are, we would love to do that. Uh, we also accept the fact that uh, there is business involved and there is money to be paid. If you are making money, you have to pay out money. Don't treat consultants, coaches, mentors as you know freebies loading them away. <laughs> Having said that, I think all my three panelists will agree that uh, uh, one of phone call. we would always welcome and help you out whenever it is required for this forum and i think that's all it's been lovely in the in the indian dna we are bar paying for advice <laughs> that's exactly my point yeah no? there's free advice all over <laughs> yeah so feel free to connect with us on linkedin I'm happy to you know get connected and see how best we can contribute to your success that's Excellent. true thank you everyone thank you. thank you my fellow panelists thank you thank you uh, we are coming to close for the session thank you so much speakers anand sagita ready shankar thank you so much for being not just a speaker but also hosting it for us this day this was one of the first ones thank you people we will be having next time outside of yeah. and money whatever whatever and, works uh, man coffee or <laughs> coffee coffee <laughs> coffee works for me i am a non alcoholic guy <laughs> chai for me Yeah. All right. So, I, so I, when I hit Chennai or something, I will uh, I come over for a filter coffee. Please come. Chai pe charcha ya coffee pe charcha is always fine. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Yes, we need to hook up. Yeah. And, 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 we will. We will. Thank you. Thanks. We come to a close. Thank you so much. See you again in some time. Namaste. Namaste.